Hello and welcome to another Daniel Revelation Talks. I'm Cody Mori here with Pastor Bill Hughes. Last time we looked at the plagues in Revelation chapter 16, and now we're getting into just the final few chapters here of Revelation. And we're going to start with Revelation chapter 17 and talk about what the Bible refers to as the whore of Babylon or the harlot of Babylon. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come before your throne with a desire to serve you, and in thus serving you, to preach the truth here today. We ask for the truth as it is in Jesus. We ask that you would help us, your people, to understand Revelation chapter 17 as we study to learn who this great enemy is called the harlot of Babylon and what we can do as a people to be ready, to be ready for the times that are coming upon this earth and to be ready to serve you and be your witnesses on this earth in the last days. Help us as we study in Jesus precious name. Amen. Amen. So, Pastor Hughes, as always, I will read the chapter and hand it off to you. <laughs> Revelation chapter 17, starting in verse 1. It says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come, Hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast which carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Seven heads are seven mountains upon, uh, on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which hath received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Quite a lot of symbolism there. Oh <laughs> Go 
study clearly in verse 1 of Revelation 17. It's talking about the specific judgments because Revelation 16 was talking about judgments or plagues upon people, groups, on those that worship the beast and his image, on those that uh, received his mark. But here in Revelation 17, God is sending a message. This is the judgments that will fall on the great whore that sits upon many waters. So it's very specific. It's very clear. Uh, of course, the symbol of a impure woman that we see here in Revelation 17 and verse 1, uh, throughout Scripture, we have seen it a number of times before we will make reference to different verses whenever gods the professed people of god went into apostasy they were considered an impure woman uh, be it a whore a harlot a prostitute however you want to slice and dice it so here we have an impure church and the judgments of heaven are going to fall on this apostate church it's that simple uh, now some examples we have isaiah 1 20 and 21 we have jeremiah 3 verses 6 through 8 we have the entire book of hosea that discusses the relationship that God's people, represented by Hosea the prophet, had with Gomer, a prostitute. And Gomer clearly represents God's professed people in apostasy. Another example, Ezekiel chapter 16, the entire chapter looks at ancient Israel falling away from heaven and God called them a harlot. God called them a whore, a prostitute. So here in Revelation 17, under the symbol of an impure woman, we have clearly identified an apostate church. And it couldn't be any plainer, couldn't be any clearer. And for those, Cody, who want to look at this point and say, well, that's not loving. Cody, God, God has left us this message to warn us as to a world power at the end of Earth's history that would rule the world. And he wants to warn us in absolute love so that we can be saved in his kingdom. Because God knows there is no salvation in this apostate church. So for those who say, you know, we don't want to offend anybody, well, you know, if you want to come right down to brass tacks, 66 and two-thirds percent of God's final warning messages to this world are offensive. Revelation 14.8 calls out Babylon. In the context of 1844, the apostate Protestant churches that's offensive to those who are in those apostate Protestant communions. I'm sorry. That's what the Bible says. The third angel's message, the beast, his image, his mark, the papacy, apostate Protestantism, Sunday keeping. No, no, that's offensive. I'm sorry. It's in infinite love that God sends repeated messages to rebuke, 
to warn and to help people forsake those fallen communions. It's a, it's a message of infinite love. If somebody is offended by it, I'm sorry. I, I, but actually, Cody, I'm not sorry. Because these are God's messages, and he gives them because he loves humanity and wants to save them. So these are messages of infinite love to fallen man at the end of earth's history. I have one question. Please. What would you say to those who, though you have interpreted the woman as an apostate church, what would you say to those that would turn and say, no, it's not an apostate Christian church, but this is talking about God's apostate people, the Jewish people. Because there are people that will say that the whore of Babylon and all the references that you made there, like Ezekiel chapter 16, it's talking about the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. So what would you say to somebody that would turn and apply that to the Jewish people or perhaps just the, the elite Jewish people versus the Roman Catholic Church system? Cody, the Jewish church. Number one, Revelation 17, we are looking at the very close of time. The Jewish church, as it were, based on the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, in connection with Acts chapter 7, with the stoning of Stephen, the Jewish church has ceased to be a part of Bible prophecy since the stoning of Stephen. So because this apostate church here in Revelation 17 is looking way down at the very close of verse history, the times in which we live, this apostate church clearly could not have any reference to Judaism at all because they ceased to be a part of Bible prophecy since 34 AD. So that, that would be my response. So essentially the other parts that we've already studied, right, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9 would disagree with that assessment because Daniel chapter 9 quite literally says that 70 weeks are determined for your people. So it, it, is, it is a, it is a uh, or as it's, it says, a cut off, right? So once the stoning of Stephen occurred, the nation of Israel itself and, and, and their religion, which was separated from the messianic fulfillment of Christ, making it a false religion. Um, they are no longer part of prophecy. They're, they're just like any other religion which needs to come to Christ and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Um, now, the, to say that they're like every other religion, that's not necessarily true, obviously, because they have a lot of, they have the Torah, they have um, a lot of wonderful truths there, but like other religions, they need to renounce their, their pharisaical leaders and rulers that they still study to this day in the Talmud and need to instead accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, which will unlock, which will unlock the aspects of the Bible that perhaps they could have a better understanding of with the tabernacle and temple services. Absolutely, Cody. Absolutely. I mean, there's no other, no other group uh, save, save God's last day professing people that had more and greater light than the ancient Jewish church. Right. Uh, with the temple, the sanctuary services, 
the prophets, the understanding of God's law. Uh, the Jewish people were blessed above almost every other group of people on this planet. So in that sense, they are unique. But in light of their fall and their rejection by heaven in 34 AD, what you're saying holds abs is absolutely correct. They need to repent and come to Jesus Christ as any other backslidden or unrepentant people or as individuals. And I think another aspect of this too to consider is the fact that when the disciples asked Jesus Christ about the last days, which they equated with the destruction of the temple as well, which was not true. He gave one answer to answer two questions. But one of the things he's mentioned that he, uh, Jesus mentioned in his answer was deception, deception, deception. Um, and so I think something that we've, we got to consider there when it's talking about is this talking about the Jewish people who have rejected God? Are they the whore of Babylon, as some assert? Or, or, is, this a, or is this a fallen church? And I think, I think the question of which is more deceptive sort of answers that. Because the Jewish people, um, if, they, if you accept their doctrines, yes, it's a false religion. But with a fallen church, there will be people who think, who actually think they're true Christians and can be lost in the system. And that's why it has to be a Christian church, because there has to be people who are deceived, not people openly and willingly rejecting Jesus Christ, as it is with Judaism, but people who think that they're actually doing what Christ wants them to do, and they're deceived, and they're lost, and they don't know it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now today, in our world, the idea of a conspiracy is anathema. You know, you're a conspiracy theorist. How can you believe in a conspiracy? There's no such thing. Well, the Bible says there is a conspiracy. Because right here in Revelation 17, 1 and 2, you have two groups right there united together with a sinister purpose in mind to carry it out on the inhabitants of the earth. Webster's Dictionary tells us that that's exactly what a conspiracy is. Right. Two or more groups of people united together with a sinister purpose. That's what we have here in Revelation 17, 1 and 2. Is there a conspiracy today? Absolutely there is. And the people that say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, there's no conspiracy. The reason they say that is either they've been blinded by the conspiracy or they're trying to put people's minds away from that obvious fact. So the kings of the earth, who are the kings of the earth? Well, kings have kingdoms. Kings are political leaders. Kings are dictators. Kings are presidents. Kings are chancellors. Kings are political leaders that have sway over the masses of humanity and they guide the affairs of nations. That's who the kings of the earth are. So are you, are you, are you suggesting that the communist dictator and the Republican elected president, I mean through republicanism, not necessarily the, 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 the party, that they are both, according to prophecy, colluding with the fallen church spoken of here in Revelation chapter 17. 
exactly what the Bible says. Wow. Exactly what the Bible says. Whether you are looking at communist leaders, leaders in the free world, whether you are looking in socialistic nations, communistic nations, monarchical systems, it doesn't matter. And the Bible does not delineate those. The Bible doesn't say, well, you know, the ones that are in nations where there's a monarchy or a king, uh, they're exempt from the inroads of Babylon the Great. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not delineate the difference and say one is distinct from and separate from Babylon the Great, the apostate church. The Bible doesn't say that. We're looking at all leaders. They are the ones involved in and in cahoots with Babylon the Great. Wow. Let's, let's add a little bit of muscle and tissue to what we're saying here. Does that then mean that Joe Biden, the quote-unquote leader of the new world, and Vladimir Putin, who is the leader of the communist world, along with Kim Jong-il of North Korea and Netanyahu of Israel, are we saying that all four of those political leaders are in cahoots with Babylon the Great? That is exactly what we're saying. That is exactly what the Bible is saying. Are we also including in that group the leader of the Ukraine, Mr. Zelensky? Absolutely it includes him. That's what Revelation 17.2 is telling us. Whether we like it or not, that's what the Bible says. I recently saw an interview with someone who was a, an, a, his, a his, history expert on, it was a podcast on Ron Paul's podcast. Ron Paul, I'm sure you've heard of him before. Um, his son Rand Paul is a current senator. Kentucky. Yes. Um, Ron Paul had, had this man who was a, a, a historian and subject matter expert on, on banking. In, in the United States and throughout the world. And one of the things that he, he posited in the interview that I think was such a powerful statement was that, you know, a lot of people, they see what's going on with uh, Joe Biden and they think that the answer is Donald Trump. And one of the things that we all need to remember is that the Federal Reserve has, and I'm, I'm not quoting him verbatim here, but this was the gist. He said that the Federal Reserve has had this country by the throat for a long time. And for Donald Trump to be, have a successful economy and Joe Biden to have an unsuccessful economy is totally 100% within the power of the shadowy figures that are behind the Federal Reserve. So the fact of the matter is, is that if Trump was legitimate, uh, a legitimate enemy of the globalists, of these powers, but if he's the exception to this rule, there would have been economic disaster, and there wasn't. And that's one of the hallmark ways that you can tell when something is, when something is true or whether it's controlled opposition. You know, I had a gentleman uh, correspond with me from Africa, and he said, um, he said, what about this guy on Fox News that was recently fired, Tucker Carlson? Right. And apparently somebody else had done some, uh, a meeting about the firing of Tucker Carlson 
And so he asked me, he said, what do you think of this man? Was he uh, doing God's work? And my response was, Tucker Carlson was working for a Roman Catholic in Rupert Murdoch for a number of years. If Tucker Carlson was not playing Rupert Murdoch's Catholic agenda on Fox News, he would have been let go a long time ago. And I, I said to the person, don't we see that Rome plays both sides of the auditorium? They control the liberal, far left machinery. They control the far right machinery. And this, like you said, Cody, a great illustration. The, the idea that Biden is working for Rome and Donald Trump, Trump was our savior. No, he wasn't. They're simply playing both sides of the aisle. That's all there is to it. It's the, it's the Hegelian dialectic right before our eyes. That's all it is. So... And the person was absolutely correct about how the Federal Reserve has literally dominated the United States uh, for the last over 100 years. Yeah. Now the Bible says that the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So they have united together with this apostate church that we will identify here soon uh, when we see some characteristics. At this point, we're, we're seeing an apostate church that relishes and sees the power in uniting with the governments of the earth. Joining the church and the state together. Now, of course, that was manifest throughout the Dark Ages as the papal system sought to join the church and state together because they realized in so doing they could control the politicians to carry out their decrees and to persecute anyone who didn't go along with their tradition. So here we have again the church state union and as a result of the unification of the church and the state the result is the earth becomes drunk on the wine of this fornication. Now we've noticed before that the wine of this fornication represents the false teaching that the apostate church and the kings of the earth are more than happy to pawn off on the inhabitants of the earth because they make themselves the most powerful. Instead of pointing people to the word of God as the ultimate authority, when the church and state join together, the focus is no longer on establishing the authority of the Bible. Now the sole import is the establishment of the authority of the church leaders and the state leaders. And that principle of supplanting the scriptures as the sole authority completely removes humanity from seeing the truth of God's word and now they are led to trust in men 
in positions of responsibility. And the result is drunkenness, foolishness, and suicide for the inhabitants of the earth. And there, that's what we have through verse 2. We have a horrific, a horrific picture that is painted of this apostate church uniting with the governments of the world to then pawn off on humanity the answers for life in religion and politics. Right. But in so doing, they have supplanted the only one who can truly show them the light of truth, and that's the word of God. So it's, it's a hideous picture that we see through verses 1 and 2 of Revelation 17. And it's quite interesting, too. Mrs. White states in many places, including the great controversy, that the particular wine or doctrine upon which the entire earth is drunk off of, it includes all of her false doctrines, but there's two that primarily uh, <coughs> take precedence over all of them because they use these, especially in the last days, to control the world. And that is the doctrine of the immortality of the soul and the doctrine of Sunday rest Sabbath. Those two doctrines they use to control people and to keep them away from God because by, by believing in those things they separate themselves from God and that's why in Revelation chapter 16 as you mentioned last time when it says the three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon or spiritualism out of the mouth of the beast the Roman Catholic Church system and out of the mouth of the false prophet which is fallen apostate Protestantism, all three of those things, including the spiritualistic side, they use that, that idea of immortality of the soul to have spirits of the dead come to people and to tell them that the Bible's wrong and that they should be keeping Sunday, up to and including impersonating Jesus Christ himself, as Satan will do. And so it's through these two doctrines, the doctrine really of spiritualism, which is what immortality of the soul is, mm -hmm. and the doctrine of Sunday worship, which is the destruction of God's commandments and the destruction of, of God's identity because his, his signature, his seal is there. Those two doctrines turn, the, just those two doctrines, among others, there's others as well, but those two are primary, primary because those two doctrines separate, cleanly separate people from God and put them in rebellion against Him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Cody. Great point. Great point. Verse 3. So He carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So now we're introduced to another character. Now we're introduced to a beast. In verses 1 and 2, we had a great whore. We had an apostate church, a religion. Right. But now we see what really gives force and power to this church. And there's a beast. And throughout scripture from Daniel, the book of Daniel chapter 7, right on through Revelation 13, we have seen that a beast represents world power, political power. So we see this woman sitting upon political power. Right. And so now we've got this, this church that's not really a church. It's, it's really a religious, political powerhouse. That's what it is. Uh, 
it's more involved in politics than it is in the salvation of humanity. That's what this religious power is. So it's pointing out these two different characteristics really to show you what are the two identifying marks of what this full power together is. It's a religio-political power. It's the church and the state together. And it's very similar. It's very similar seeing the way Daniel chapter 7 separates the two entities of the beast power and then the little horn power that comes out from the beast. So it, it, it tells you, when you read that, it tells you that, well, yes, the horn is part of the beast. They're one entity in essence, but they are, they are different from each other as well. And that, that's highlighted by the fact that there's the little horn that does certain things, but it's still on top of the beast. So it's still part of that beast system. And that's what we're seeing here too. It's a very good point, Cody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, now, first symbol I want to look at in verse 3 is the wilderness. Mm. What is the wilderness? Well, we know from Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and verse 14, that the true church, the Bible tells us, we'll read verse 14 of Revelation 12. The Bible says, To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Now this woman in Revelation 12 is a pure woman. So in contrast to the impure woman in Revelation 17, this pure woman in Revelation 12 represents God's church through all time. Right. Okay? So the Bible says, verse 14, to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So the true church flees into the wilderness and the Bible says she flees there for three and a half times. Now we've seen from other scriptures, Daniel 7, 25, uh, Daniel 12, verse 7, Revelation 11, verse 2, Revelation 11, verse 3, uh, Revelation 12, verse 6, Revelation 12, verse 14, Revelation 13, verse 5, that in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, we have reference to the same 1260-year period when the papacy ruled the world through the Dark Ages. Now the Bible tells us in Revelation 12, verse 14, that the pure church fled into the wilderness during that 1260-year period. So my question would be, where did God's true people flee to during the Dark Ages. The well, Bible says it's the wilderness. It's interesting because we're, we're, we're thrown in the midst of, of passages here that are symbolic in nature. So we're looking for a spiritual wilderness because God's people at that time, where, where did they go literally? To answer that, they, they went to the New World. They went to uh, South Africa. They went to different parts. They went away from the Holy Roman Empire, primarily to the New World over here in the United, what later became the United States. But they fled that area. They fled where the Holy Roman Empire was. Okay. In the book Great Controversy, pages 54 and 55, Ellen White quotes Revelation chapter 12, and she says the true church for the 1260-year period 
fled into seclusion and obscurity. Right. So they, they, they were basically in hiding in many ways. Right. Throughout that 1260 year period. Now, of course, at the time of the Reformation, of course, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and, and those that followed them, they were much more prominent. But for about that thousand years, from 538 down to the 16th century, God's true church, Cody, were in seclusion. They were, they were acting like they were merchants, mm. or they were acting as though they were tradesmen, and sewed into their clothing would be a portion of scripture because they didn't want to get caught by the mother church at that time because they knew what would happen if they did. So the wilderness, Ellen White is very clear, it's seclusion, it's obscurity. And as you said, it's wanting to be away from the apostate church during the Dark Ages. But since it's, so it's a spiritual wilderness, really. So it's obscurity. Obscurity. It's not a literal wilderness necessarily, though it could be. No, it could absolutely. be. Um, so like with the Waldenses, you had them. They stayed pretty much in the heart, heart of the kingdom there, right next to um, southern France and northern Italy, some of the most uh, historically Catholic powerhouses. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the Pope, the only two places the Pope ever lived was Italy and France, and that's it. Um, and, and they were right there. And then you had the others, of course, that left and went to the New World. So, so what you're saying is taking that principle that now it is the harlot who is in obscurity, who is in the shadows, who is working behind the scenes in hiding, not out openly, like during the Dark Ages when the church-state system was set up and it was on full display. Exactly, Cody. Absolutely. That's what I firmly believe Revelation 17 and verse 3 is telling us. That John, to see this apostate religious power, he says, I had to go behind the scenes. Right. I had to go into seclusion. I had to go in obscure places because no longer is this apostate religious power that had dominated the world for over a thousand years. Now they're, they're behind the scenes. And so my question then would be, when... Did this apostate religious power, when did they go into obscurity? When did they go behind the scenes, as it were, in history? When did that happen? We couldn't say that this, that this passage is talking about the Dark Ages because the apostate church which clearly, and we're going to see it momentarily with this one symbol of blasphemy. This apostate religious power in Revelation 17 can be none other than the Roman Catholic system. So the question then that we're faced with, when did the papacy go into seclusion? When did they go behind the scenes? Because that didn't happen during the Dark Ages. So when did that happen in history? And do we have any hints in other portions of the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, 
as to when that occurred. Well, since the true church had to go into the wilderness for a time and times and a half, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to think that at the close of that time period that God's true church would be permitted to be more in the open than they were in the past. And therefore, the false church would have to start working in the shadows. So as you kind of, as you see the Reformation picking up steam and true gospel teachings coming to the forefront and battling against um, pagan and, and just plain false error doctrines that come out of papal Rome, eventually, once that prophecy is fulfilled of the times, the 1260-year period, what happened? Well, what happened was the papacy was taken into exile. All her papal states that were her property were, were totally uh, taken from her. And a republic was declared in Italy. And from that point on, the, the papacy has had to work more behind the scenes than she has been able to in the past, where she's been able to just operate in the forefront through kings, through bishops, through other political leaders, through merchants. Now she would have to make these connections behind closed doors, not in the forefront of the people, which actually would lend credence to the idea that, that according to Bible prophecy, there is a conspiracy. No question. There is no question, then, that as the true church is coming out of seclusion and obscurity, as the 1260 years are coming to a close, and it, as the 1260 years are coming to a close in 1798, there was the, one of the greatest revivals in the history of the church at that very time. The church was indeed coming out of obscurity. Mission stations, Bible societies were being established all over the world as the gospel was being presented to the world. And in 1798, as Revelation 13 declares, the papacy did receive a deadly wound and did and was forced to go into seclusion. And Cody, as you said, uh, they had been working conspiratorially mm. ever since, ever since. Because their goal has been to declare to the world we're no longer like we were during the Dark Ages. We're changed. We now want to present to you a fair front that we are truly a loving Christian organization. And that Rome continues to pawn off on the inhabitants of this world to this very day. So in, an, in essence, too, by saying that, by saying when the Bible says that she's working in the wilderness and she's obviously from the other few verses, she's working in the wilderness and yet she's making connections with these kings and we'll see other powers that she makes connections with, too, later on in the chapter. That proves that not only all the kings on both sides of the aisles and every political spectrum you can think of are all working together for her, for her purposes. But it also suggests that those powers and entities that we hear so much about, like the Illuminati, like the Freemasons, like the Bilderberg Group, like the Trilateral Commission, 
or the Council on Foreign Relations, that all these groups that are doing these sort of conspiratorial things, that they're actually being controlled by the whore of Babylon who has been working in the shadows since 1798. Bingo. That's exactly right. See, during the Dark Ages, Rome made no bones about it through the Inquisition that they were the murderers of hundred, hundred plus millions of people. In our modern time, through their connection to the kings of the earth, now they don't come out and say, we're the ones doing this slaughtering. No, now they use Mao Zedong. Right. Now they use Jesuit trained Joseph Stalin. That's who they use. In the Western world, they've used Franklin Roosevelt. They've used Dwight David Eisenhower, Lyndon Johnson, William Jefferson Clinton. While Rome presents a fair front to the world. So when people were, it's, it's very deceptive, isn't it? Because if people go to look into some of these issues where people die and where there's, where there's clearly some corruption going on, they might get to the communists and stop. They might get to the Freemasons and stop or the Illuminati or some other group, Skull and Bones or something, and, and, and look up them and then stop, or stop at some of these butchers like Mao Zedong or Joseph Stalin and stop and not realize that if you continue to research, eventually you will, in all the cases you've mentioned, you will find a Jesuit, usually a Jesuit, but always at least a Roman connection as to how these people were trained, how they were raised, or where these groups eventually come from. They come from Jesuit strongholds. They come from these, these places where you would expect that Rome would have a hand in, in, in the fledgling, uh, you know, growing up of these secret societies. So it's, it's really scary when you think about it that way because it means that Anything that you study, you have not reached the full truth of it if you're studying a society or a communist regime until you trace it all the way back to Rome. One other comment, Cody, I, I want to make is that a man by the name of John Cornwall learned that Rome was going to beautify Pope Pius XII. Pope Pius XII was the Pope from 1939 to 1958. John Cornwall was a devout Roman Catholic. He requested of the Vatican archives access so he could write a book about how wonderful Pope Pius XII was. He wrote a book called Hitler's Pope. John Cornwall realized that Pope Pius XII was just as much a part of the killing of six million Jews as was Adolf Hitler. The blood of all. That's right. Will you please close us out in prayer, Pastor Hughes? Yes, sir. 
Father in heaven, we are grateful for the authority of your word. Yes. May we ever stand. May we ever uphold the authority of this word in our hearts, in our lives, and to every person with whom we come in contact. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.